Thank you so much. Um, thanks everybody for coming out tonight. Uh, Holly and I have uh, we, we, um, put this presentation together in the last little bit, and we haven't presented this material before, so and we haven't actually presented before together, so uh, you know maybe some bumps along the way, but uh, we'll give our best. And uh, yeah, thank you. I hope you enjoy it. Uh, Holly, you want to start out by yourself? No, like uh, Matt was saying, we've never presented together before. We actually were out this presentation around 11 p.m. last night. So uh, I really appreciate his last minute putting it all together. And it's so last minute because we're trying to base as much of our information off of current beta and of course, obviously off of Matt's long, long history. So myself, ACMG guy, my first time doing the Spearhead Traverse was back in 2007. I thought I could do it in a day and I knew very little beta. I read some books and I just got all my gear and started walking and the next thing I know was 12 hours later and I was still walking and it was really dark. <laughs> so hopefully we'll be able to share information with you that will help make your trip a little easier. Thanks. Um, uh, so yeah, my name's Matt. I've been living uh, in the area for since maybe 98 and I think I did the spearhead in the first year that I moved here. Um, and uh, yeah, quite a great passionate about the mountains around here. I'm not a professional, I'm, a, I'm actually a bureaucrat, but uh, I, I quite enjoy getting out in the mountains and do it as much as I can given you know, the, the complications of life. Um, I, before we get going, I'm curious to know a little bit about who's here, and just by show of hands, I, I'm curious how many people have done the Spearhead Traverse. Okay, so a handful of people. How many people are keen to do the Spearhead Traverse? Are most people keen to do the Spearhead Traverse? Okay, cool. And, uh, and I'm also curious, uh, okay, how many people have skied in the Black Cone Backcountry? So quite a, few, quite a bit of familiarity with that. And um, another question I have is, how many people have been skiing for like five plus years? Uh, and 10 plus years? Okay, so a fair bit of experience in the room. All right, well, um, when Holly and I put together uh, the show, we weren't sure what to expect for the crowd, so we actually designed it around uh, the idea of uh, doing a three-day traverse. Although I'm curious, given the experience, how many people are thinking, I want to go do that as a day trip? And how many people are thinking, I want to do it as an overnight? Okay, so uh, kind, of, kind of a mix. Um, so yeah, so our, our thoughts are, are really around, you know, if you're organizing to do a three-day trip, but uh, all, most of what we're talking about around the terrain and the, uh, you know, the, the navigation and all that uh, is really um, equally relevant to a day trip. And maybe we'll toss in some ideas about that. Um, and I thought on this slide, I just wanted to start out um, with a couple things about why I think the Spirit Traverse is a great trip. Um, just to like share the enthusiasm, I think you're probably already excited about it, so I don't have to sales pitch you. But um, a few things that I really like about the trip. One, um, I love the fact that you can jump on the lift and get off like at the top of the mountain. It's, you know, around here there's a lot of slogging up through the trees, and this is like one of the notable ex exceptions. So amazing access, and uh, it's a loop. I'm like a huge fan of loops because you don't have to, yeah, okay, horseshoe, sure, sure. Uh, or loop, okay, you know, I got a potato, I don't know. Um, but uh, it, uh, you get to like cover new terrain the whole way around. Um, you're up high with great views, the scenery is spectacular, lots of great terrain. I don't know, Polly, any things about the spearhead that jump out at you? We'll talk about this later, but the fact that, you know, we should try to do it with the lowest avalanche risk and the best weather possible. Well, if you do it early season in November or December, you can make it as interesting as you want. So I think what's cool about the spearhead traverse is it's always a variety based on you know, differences in weather, differences in partners, differences in your own physical abilities. So um, it's pretty cool that it, each and every time it's going to be a different adventure. Actually, and one thing you said there, um, uh, so like picking trips in good conditions, especially if you're like, I want to do that as a one day trip, um, picking the right day is really such a critical piece of that. And so one of the awesome things about the spearhead, hey, who lives in Squamish? It's your backyard, like it's really just 45 minutes away. So like, you're like, it's Saturday and it's good. Boom, you're there, you do it, you're back. So um, yeah, it's right next door. I'd say that's gonna be the best thing. It's what we've got, love what you got. Okay, um, okay, so so our, our talk was like, we, we kind of, we structured it around like a bunch of things to, to do to be successful on a trip. So the first one we've got is planning. I'm actually a planner, so I, maybe I'll take this one. Um, but I am a land use planner, uh, but anyway, um, so, um, okay, so planning, so there's a few things that I was going to talk about here. 
the first one, and I won't go on and on about it, but um, I think one of the really uh, great things that exists now are these amazing tools for um, planning trips. You know, uh, we've got FatMap, CalTopo, um, Google Earth, like they're really incredible ways to visualize the terrain before you head out there. And the thing I wanted to talk about in this slide was, um, I think it's, it's, it's a long trip, right? It's, uh, it's like 34K and you know, it's 17 to 2,000 2, meters. Like it's, it's a fair bit of elevation and distance and, and a lot of transitions, a lot of um, glaciers and peaks to wrap around. Um, there's a lot of complexity to it. And uh, on a trip, if, especially for those of you thinking about doing it as a date, or if you're carrying a big pack and you don't want to be doubling back or wandering around, I think it's really worthwhile in this trip and you know, in general going into the mountains to spend the time to get familiar with the terrain as much as possible before you go. Now, it used to be sitting down and looking at a topo map and really trying to understand what things look like, but now you can just pull up Google Earth, turn on the satellite imagery and like, like do the route ahead of time. So I think it's really worthwhile spending a whole lot of time getting familiar with what the route is like. And one thing uh, I would say in, in relation to that is now that we've, we're all using digital navigation tools and um, we have the ability to create tracks that we can then follow while we're out in the field. And so I think it's really good to do. I do think there's a risk to um, just borrowing tracks or getting tracks from people. And, and it's very easy to do. I, I certainly do it myself. I don't know if you found this, but when you um, end up with a track, you, you immediately kind of have this sense of like confidence, like, okay, I know where I'm going and I can take off. And I think it's easy to fall into this, this um, uh, kind of idea of like, grab the track, I'm ready and take off. And I think it's really worthwhile taking that track and spending some time getting familiar with it. In part because when you're out there, you never know if you're going to um, have the, like there's, there's the possibility of tracks being inaccurate or you having, uh, you know, technology failure. I think it's worthwhile having that. But um, I also want to talk a little bit about some of the risks associated with just using tracks that you've gotten without checking through or getting to know them. Um, we've seen some incidents even recently in the area where people have gotten in trouble, um, perhaps with a reliance on tracks. and. Um, you know, when you're just grabbing a track, if it's not something that you spent your time putting together and, and organizing and understanding, um, there's a possibility that track may not be accurate. I, I, before this trip, I pulled it, I Googled, you know, spearhead tracks or spearhead traverse and found a track on a, on a site. And there was a couple sections on it that I actually, I just wanted to highlight for you how some things that you can pull can have some real risk associated. This one that I got, um, here's a, a section back at the back end of the spearhead traverse on Iago. And, the yellow line, which is what the track is, actually cruises over some cliffs. Um, on another section, uh, this is the track that on this this that I pulled, and it actually the yellow line being the track, it goes over some cliffs again, and then goes to the wrong call. The blue line is the typical traverse line, and then there was an, another one where it, you can just see it, it goes up over a cliff there. <laughs> so I, I just want to, and this is not to throw any particular source of tracks under the bus, but if you are if you had just grabbed that view like Google, downloaded it, thrown it onto your phone and headed out the door, and then wound up at the back end and weather moved in, which has happened to me, you know, you, you can easily like see Blue Sky Day and convective activity can lead, lead you in a whiteout to the back end. If you're all of a sudden like, well, I know this, I've got this track, and you start wandering. Like this track, I think in three different areas, it's quite likely you wouldn't have made it home. So I really think it's worth taking that time to, to use the tools that are available and get yourself familiar with the route and maybe design your own track. Like just, it's really easy to draw yourself a route using whatever resources, maps, guidebooks, whatnot. Um, and if anybody is feeling like, hey, I, I don't I, you know, I don't use those tools in that way, and I'm not familiar with it, I just, for ease, there's this great source, Zenith. If you guys know Evan Stevens, he's done some of these events. And he has a website, uh, zenithguides.ca, and he sells for 50 bucks this um, navigation course, which I did maybe last year. And I probably, like I've been doing this for decades, and I learned a ton off that thing. So if you want to learn how to, how to use those tools, it's a great source. He also, as part of that, you know, it all has a great um, section about uh, weathers, a weather, which is another planning tool you really want to spend time understanding the weather that's coming. Spot WX, great site, understanding things like you know the, the cloud formation, the winds, the freezing levels, um, really key part of the planning process. Um, it's spring now, so one thing with planning, I'd say if you're doing a multi-day, is to recognize how, um, in, how much impact the solar uh, heating will have on the slopes. And so if you're doing a multi-day, which the thought we're talking about, it's worth planning to start really early and 
chill in the afternoon when the slopes destabilize, you get those isothermal conditions. So having a, um, a book. Uh, then, you know, before heading out, obviously checking in on current conditions. Lots of sources that you guys are probably aware of. Um, again, um, Evan with Zenith has uh, got this great uh, email that he's sending out. Who's actually signed up for Evan's uh, email? Okay, see a few of you. This thing is actually fantastic. So Evan and Eric Carter, if you go to Zenith Mountain Guys on his uh, Instagram, you can link to his website and find where to sign up for it. But uh, every week they send out a uh, conditions update. And not only do they talk about what they've seen in the past week, they're, they're both skiing in the area a lot. Um, they talk about what's coming in with the weather and what to look for and how to anticipate how that'll impact uh, conditions. So I think that's super uh, useful. Um, the, obviously, they launch Canada, but spending the time to go through and look for those um, uh, information network reports that little uh, on the map, the little uh, icons that show up where you can get details about what's happening. And if you're heading to the spearhead and you want to have some uh, up-to-date information, there's a couple guys around who are out there a lot and seem to post a fair bit. And one is uh, uh, Mitch Salkers, Smiley Bird Nest. He's out there all the time. That's that uh, on the left, that first Instagram uh, handle. Um, he, uh, he's an avalanche instructor and spends a fair bit of time putting in fairly detailed information whenever he's out, so really useful. And then Brent Phillips, the Spearhead Mountain Guides, he's like out there skiing all the time. And just posts, he's like constantly posting shots, which isn't great if you work in an office and you're not getting out very much. You're like, ah. <laughs> yes, I know. <laughs> and, and he got the spine and everything today. Yeah, so like it's, it's painful. But it's, you can even just from seeing those images, you can get a pretty good sense of what's going on. So, you know, it's worth uh, making sure you understand the current conditions. And then I think maybe it sounds like a lot of people have skied in this area, but I think if you're thinking about doing the spearhead, I think uh, it's really worthwhile to be familiar with, with the, the sections that you can through day trips. So I think it's worth uh, heading out um, from Blackcomb and, you know, heading back to Troy. Like, just get really familiar with that initial part of the route. Because if you're doing a multi-day and you've got a big pack, or if you're doing a single day and you're going to push, you don't want to have to be like making navigational decisions in the, in the initial section. You just want to like get up there and like boom, 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 go for it. And you can do it as a day trip. You can go back to Troy, get some great skiing as a day, and be familiar with that part of the route and know what you're doing. And then um, I think for those of you that haven't been down singing uh, past, uh, I, it's something that would be worth going out and doing a trip down out to Whistler and, and come down singing past just because if you've done the whole trip and you're you're tired, it's kind of a, a bit of, for some it's actually quite pleasant. I actually love slinging senior you pass, you just kind of stand there, <laughs> zoom down the loose track, but you certainly hear people that find it to be like a terrifying, you know, icy and, and tiring experience, especially maybe if you're on a split board and you have to go into like struggle with that. I, I don't split board, so, um, but I, you know, I've seen people struggling along there. So worthwhile doing a bit of recon and getting familiar with that. Okay, next year. So I can talk about gear for hours. I won't get too deep into it, but um, in the context of doing a three-day traverse, I think it's just super important that everyone acknowledges you are going to be traveling over 11 glaciers, highly glaciated terrain, and also, especially this year, there's just so many open slots. Please, please, please carry not just one rope, but two ropes for you and your partner. Hopefully, you're not going solo trying to do a speed ascent. But if you are the one carrying the rope and you fall into their crevasse, well, who's going to pull you out? And, you know, there is some general public out there, but we shouldn't go into a trip being reliant on people we don't know. And then also be really familiar with your glacier gear. You know, if you haven't taken a crevasse rescue course or if you have a best friend that's just really dialed with systems, practice in your backyard. Get your systems out before you get out onto the glacier. You don't want to be start scratching your head in the middle of a storm in a whiteout with your friend that's fallen into the crevasse being like, oh shit, I don't remember how I'm supposed to be doing this. Um, other just key gear you want to be packing is ski crampons. So much of the terrain that you're traveling up is north facing and you are descending south facing sides, but there's a lot of sections where you're just traversing and it's just super uncomfortable, super awkward. And just having those ski crampons are kind of like a make or break piece of gear. And every spring, someone decides, oh, I want to do Spirit Traverse. They call every shop around in town and no one has the crampons they need for their skis. So start doing research now if you don't already own them and call those shops. And don't rent them, just buy them. I'm not trying to promote, you know, consumerism, but I've owned that black pair of ski crampons right there for 15 years. 
So they'll last forever. If you decide to change bindings though, you will have to buy different ski crampons later. So I committed 15 years ago that I was gonna buy one pair of bindings and I've upgraded them over the years, but it's the same style. So I have the same crampons. So you get my drift with all that. Um, as far as other gear goes, I definitely, you know, pack your headlamp. People try to cut corners and, you know, don't want to bring crampons. Just know that right now, we'll talk about this in a little bit, there's a couple sections that are super, super firm where you can't even get a toe in. And I was very happy three weeks ago to have my crampons. That being said, I was with a group, we were four, and we didn't all bring crampons. I was just the one that had them, meaning I was the one with, like, for the group. So as soon as I put the kick the steps in and got a solid platform, then everyone else was able to travel up. But if you don't mind sharing a pair of crampons with a friend, if you got same size feet even, um, just one extra piece of gear to bring is, you know, I really like having my GPS watch. It's huge. If you're using your iPhone or whatever, you know, micro computer in your pocket as your navigation tool, that's great. But if your battery fails on it halfway through the traverse because you're, you're burning through so much battery, I actually don't use it for navigation. I use my watch instead and then I'll pull my GPS map out on my cell phone if I need it, worst case scenario. But you know, I'm using that for a lot of other things as well. Like what if worst case scenario, I had to do a search and rescue call. You actually have really good cell coverage up on ridge lines and then you've got a cell phone in your pocket. So I definitely would save that battery on there. Um, as far as other gear goes, I think that was it from there. So yeah, move forward. Cool, cool, actually, yeah, 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 you want that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, you want to jump in? Yeah. I think jump in. And, and also, I forgot to mention the front. Uh, if anybody has like anything they want to say, oh, yeah. right back, just like put up your hand or shout something out. Because I actually, yes, I love it. You get a prize. <laughs> you get a prize. The first one. Should I do it? Should I do it? Okay. Yes, I, I love it. So just like shout out. Not everybody's going to get a prize, but yeah, by the way. So, same thing. Um, I wouldn't say everyone, you know, just dependent on what is the current condition. So right now, like I said, we're going to talk about it in a little bit. There's two boot pack sections where it's very, very firm. And I was very happy I had my ice axe to plunge and put in. That being said, if people carry their skis, like they're in the AK, like in Alaska, straight in front of them, they are almost using it like an ice axe. Um, your ski pools, you can turn them upside down and you can plant those in pretty well if you're following the person that used the ice axe already because they've already plunged those holes right so i think you know thinking as far as what your group gear is if there's one person that's going to be carrying the rope while well, the other person maybe they're the one that brings the one pair of crampons and one ice axe and they can be putting in that track for the rest of the group but if it's super firm conditions then i would just have everyone bring it you know it's going to increase the pace of your group you know it's it weighs a little bit more in your backpack, but maybe you're gonna be traveling at you know a quarter less of the speed of having to faff. This is the other thing too, it's like, I'll talk about it in a second, it's just like we're trying to avoid our faffing whenever we can, and what that just means is just, excuse my language, just fucking around. Like, we wanna just limit our transition time as far as our gear goes. Just get super dialed with your gear. The biggest thing I've seen, just, just ski touring, not even a spearhead traverse, is once a day someone's complaining about their ski boots. It's like, if you know you have a ski boot problem, do you really want to start a 34 kilometer traverse with those ski boots? Like, get, get those dialed before you start venturing that far. And, and the last thing I would say is, you know, bring a lot of gear. I'm telling you to pack a lot of stuff, but keep your backpack as light as possible. Myself, I'm a little person, so my ice axe is the same size as a big person, right? So I have to like really cut my tags off my clothes to keep my pack as light as possible. So I personally can't carry more than a third of my weight. My max is 40 pounds. But when I went and did a three-day traverse the other day, I got my pack down to 36 pounds. Jason, what did you get your pack down to? 32. So talk to Jason afterwards. He's good at packing. <laughs> Anything else? Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
Uh, one of the, the big weight uh, items in your pack is your water. Um, and, and it's, you know, especially at this time of year when it's, it's warm uh, and you're, you're going to be sweating through, you know, especially as you get further into the traverse uh, as a day. I'm thinking now of day trips, because it's so quite a few people were talking about day trips. Um, the, wh one of the things that I think is really kind of, for me, become uh, a, a really good tool is using the really lightweight stoves on day trips. So now with jet boils or reactors, um, the, if, if it's a day where it's going to be comfortable to chill for a little bit, like it's not going to be really windy or it's yeah, good, yeah, I'm not going to set any speed records, middle-aged dude here. So, um, but uh, if you're if you um, are, are you know doing a day trip, but it's going to be a comfortable uh, condition, it's actually really a better weight-wise for everybody to maybe start with one liter of water and take a reactor stove or take a jet foil and plan to take multiple stops when you, you're in a situation where it's you know it's a bit less exposed to wind or you're in a, a warm basin, you've dropped kind of maybe down Diablo or something like that where you're, you're in a south aspect and just do a big brew and everybody drink a bunch of water and, uh, and then refill your, your water bottles. You, the, you, you save the weight, the water weighs a lot and you can really save a lot by doing that with the stoves. Um, the one thing I would say is that when I've gone out with groups, if there's like six people and you've got one stove, you end up taking a lot of time. Like I kind of, you think like three people to a stove is a good ratio to like generate enough, like the weight balance. Uh, one, one stove weighs, I think it weighs less than a liter of water or somewhere around there and you can generate, but it does take some time. So I think that's a really good strategy if you're going for the day trip to really bring down your weight. Yeah, totally agree. I think it's something like, you know, one little jet oil fuel, you'll get at least 20 liters of water with it kind of deal. So definitely it's worth its weight in gold if you have the time. Um, logistics, how many people buy wilderness permits for Garibaldi Park in this crowd? You're awesome. So Garibaldi Park, we're very lucky to have it in our backyard. It's super cheap to buy a wilderness permit and it's how much does it cost? Can anyone guess? <laughs> right. Who gets a prize out of that? <laughs> yes, right. um, Mike, he gets a prize for definitely being a permit buyer. Okay. Right, right, right. Yeah, right there. Awesome. Um, so yeah, no, I, I, I highly encourage you, just go on to BC Parks website. It's the camping.bcparks.ca. You registered, no one's gonna stop you, meaning it's always open, there's always access. Whistler Blackcomb can never tell you that you can't get into the park. There's always park entrance. So if you go to the bottom of Seventh Heaven, you can always go out to the, just keep going right, and there's the exit gate. And so then no one can ever tell you you can't go to the Spearhead Traverse. You may have to go a different access point. There's also Phalanx, they've opened up another access point going out that way. So. Um, do your research, go on the website, hit your 6.30. And if you are going to go camping at the Russet Lake Campground, you do need to register for an overnight camping, and there's an outhouse there. So, But if you're going to Keys and Claire's hut, it's all included, but you're paying a lot more money. But beautiful hut, highly recommend it if you guys haven't checked it out. And then your overnight parking for Whistler Blackcomb, I'll answer your question in just one sec, um, is $8. So same thing, if you go on to Resort Municipality of Whistler, on their website, just Google it. You'll see park lot eight, no, lot four. It's eight dollars. You print it out, put it on your dash. Is Go that go. is that wilderness permit per day or per night? Yeah, it's per night. Is it for all of Garibaldi Park? It all of Garibaldi Park. Park. Yeah. But it does not include the front country. So what the front country is, and I'll just show you if I can point at this map right here. Do you see Garibaldi Lake? Check this lake. And what you can't see there is that's Decker. So I can't camp on the front side of Decker, but I can go back side, back side of Troy Glacier. And I can camp all the way around to um, Overlord Glacier. But as soon as I get close to the Keys and Claire's hut, same thing, I can't just camp where I want. It's just to control the masses so we don't just have people camping all over the place. The other thing, just a message for everyone, and I don't want to get too disgusting, but you know, there's a lot of garbage that's left out on the Spearhead Glacier and a lot of our human waste. Um, and if we're all camping, and we're all camping super close to the really popular areas, like musical bumps, it get really gross. Yeah. Do you know, I 
Yeah. Yeah. I, I have to say, I, I did the spearhead uh, as a slow trip. Like we went and camped a bunch of places and did a bunch of side trips, uh, like uh, maybe like 10, 15 years ago. And um, we went late May. Uh, and you know, at that time, the snowpack is decreasing in volume. And we camped at a number of the really popular uh, campsite locations. And in the evening, as you wander around, like I literally, like there were piles of human waste, you know, scattered all through because that, that is what people are doing. And, and I think it's one of the big, um, uh, like it's, it's, a, it's a popular location. It's a great place to go. It's not surprising that people are out using it. And that is how our system currently works. But for me, it was a really, it was a bit of a, um, you know, a moment where I, where I thought, okay, management is important. And, you know, the hut, I think the hut system is going to be a really great tool to help manage the human waste over time because, you know, those are, we're, we're just going to keep adding this. This sport is popular. It's going to continue to grow in popularity. We, I think the huts are maybe an important part of that. Yeah, I see a question. They're wag bags. What? Yes, wag bags. I, I agree. And 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 I, I have to admit, I you know, I, I occasionally um, I think, God, I should do that. Like it is, uh, I think it's probably the future of, of what, what we should be doing. And I feel a bit, um, you know, embarrassed that I haven't done that. But um, yeah, it's probably the way. Does everybody know what a wag bag is? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's a way to carry your your food home, and probably the, what we should be doing. <laughs> No, thanks again for saying that. I actually, last year on Spearhead trips that I was guiding, I made everyone pack their best yeah. out. And everyone actually felt really good about it. So um, what I find difficult, and we can talk about this later if anyone has answers or if anyone knows the answer, is that what do we do with our waste when we bring it back to the front country? We have to get, what's that? The white bags can go in the garbage. Can they? Okay, yeah. awesome. Because, yeah, some some are camp, so. Yeah, the ones okay. that are like the actual wag bags, you could, they stay right on them. You could just them. Awesome. Yeah. Sweet. Okay. This one? Yeah, uh, the arrow. I think it's the arrow. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, the next topic was efficiency. And, you know, I know you all, sounds like most people ski to a whole bunch already. You probably know a lot about bathing and efficiency. Just acknowledge, though, that the spearhead traverse, you're going to have to transition, meaning put skins on or take skins off, 20 to 30 times. So if you know you take a while to do that, start practicing, you know, on your next ski tour, wherever you go. Um, get into the pattern. Everyone has this different favorite order, but I'll pull a granola bar out and start chewing while I strip my skins tuck them in my pocket, drink some water, and then I'm moving again. So that was there for two minutes, not 10 minutes. I did some math, I think it was 25 transitions, 10 minutes equals over four hours in just transitions, not even the walking. So if we're trying to limit that first spearhead traverse, I told you it took me over 12 hours. Well, I know why, like I took a long time with my transitions. Um, pee parties, who likes to go pee? <laughs> what time do you like to go pee? Morning. Crystal, do you pee at 10 a.m.? Okay, then I'm peeing at 10 a.m. What I mean is if you're doing your traverse with five people, if one person stops to go pee, just everyone stop and go pee. You're going to save 10 minutes right there every hour, right, with just being efficient as a team. Like if someone needs to stop and have a snack, then stop and have a snack. Just all get on the same cycle of pattern of your tea party. Um, showcase tea bar. Has anyone been up the mountain lately and was the tea bar open? Was it good? Yeah? Was it the weekend or midweek? Midweek. Okay, awesome. Yeah, I just, I never know if it's going to be open or closed. So, just want you guys to know that on April 17th, Worcester Black Films announced that they're changing their hours. So, they're going to be open at 10 a.m. and you know, Matt was already talking about how we want to travel early in the morning, especially on a hot, sunny day. Well, if I can't get up the mountain till 10, well, I've already burned through a bunch of my day before I get even started. So just know if you're going to do a, someone here is going to do a four-day traverse, well, that's awesome. You've got a little bit more flex window there. Um, but if you're trying to do a single-day traverse, then maybe you want to start the night before and start at the gate. I don't know what you're gonna do, but you know what I'm saying. Like, just be efficient with that. And showcase tea bar. If it is closed, I don't know. Sorry, I don't have my laser pointer. You can go from seventh heaven chair 
along the ridge line up here and then drop in to start onto the glacier. Um, that's one way to save a bunch of time versus dropping down and then having to skin up underneath the T-bar. And then my last message was just, yeah, keep your calories high throughout the day. I noticed that myself when I get, and we'll talk about it, to, to Diavala Glacier, it's like, you know, I've done two thirds of the traverse. I just start bonking. My calories just get super low and my efficiency and my speed just is half as much. So um, definitely, and then with the water we are talking about. Anything to add? Are you good? Okay, moving along. Any questions on efficiency? Yeah. How much do I rope up versus like, carrying the rope? Yeah. That is that is a great question. Um, if you can hold that thought, and we'll come back to it, because there's a couple sections of the spearhead traverse that are highly glaciated and quite open the crevasses. On Patterson, though, um, I was out there three weeks ago, and I didn't see anything obvious that I could just walk around, right? So there's some pretty mellow ways to walk, and therefore I'll have my rope in my backpack, but I won't have it on my body, because again, that slows down your speed of movement, right? And then, uh, yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll bring that back up. And put your hand up if we've forgotten, okay? Okay, uh, where is it? Oh yeah, okay, so um, our the next chunk, which is kind of the bulk of the slideshow, we, we wanted to, we didn't want to do a, like a blow by blow of every skin and descent along the way because it would probably take too long and, and get really boring. Um, but what we thought we'd do is, is try and highlight, I think we've got maybe 10 little spots along the way where there's like either a crux or like a cool side trip or a summit you could do um, or, or some decision point. And so we've got a little map here with a star that's supposed to indicate. And just so, you know, for everyone, usually people start at Blackcomb, they usually cruise out to Decker Lake, uh, out to Patterson's Tremor, and then around Yago Back. And so um, our first kind of decision point or, or thing that we want to talk about was uh, at the back end near Tremor. Um, and this is, this is already a good chunk, like if you're doing a three-day trip, um, you know, often like a good place to, to try and camp, you know, say you're starting here at Blackcomb and you go over Decker and over Patterson and up towards uh, Tremor there, that's kind of Tremor Glacier is, is like kind of one of the spots that people might start, uh, start thinking about camping. It's about, you know, 700, 800 meters of elevation gain at 7.2. You've done probably a, a, about a third of um, the trip. But uh, if you find that you're, maybe you get to the south ridge of Patterson and you're like, something's going wrong, you're not moving very fast, you can anticipate that um, you're going to have trouble um, completing the trip. It's, it's a really easy point to do a turnaround from. Um, from Patterson, uh, you can actually exit that, that line on the bottom there. Uh, this is Decker Mountain, and there's an easy way to get out on the south side of Decker. And so it's like a really natural point to like stop and assess, like, hey, are we doing well? Are we struggling? Uh, are things going smoothly? Is this a place where we might want to contemplate exiting? And from there, really, you, you have a, you have kind of mostly downhill. From Patterson, you can actually glide most of the way back to the Patterson Decker Fall, and then there's a basin here you can put, cruise through, do a little skin up, and then just do a slide down the south side of Decker, and then a little climb, and then you're at seven, seven, and out. So, just kind of want to highlight it that if you're if you're heading out, this is a great place to have like you know a bit of a mindset like. Are things going well, or is this a place that I might want to contemplate cruising out? Um, and this is just a, a shot of uh, cruising up the Tremor Glacier past Pat Patterson. That's the next kind of big climb. It's actually one of the longer climbs on the Spearhead Traverse up Tremor. And it starts with a little bit of a steep section, and then there's quite a, a mellow section, and that's actually quite a nice place to camp. Um, and so kind of like, if I'm thinking of a three day, I'd probably think that's one of the first spots I might think about uh, camping. Uh, Paul is going to talk about getting up to that tremor call in just one second, but I would highlight um, after that, I'm going to talk a little bit about that ridge, that right hand ridge that goes up to tremor, one of the nice side trips. And you know, if you're like, if you've got time and energy, that face on tremor is quite a nice ski descent. So talk about that in a second, but uh, Paul is going to talk about Yeah, so just talk about the tremor ascent. Um, like I was telling you all, I did it three weeks ago and spoke to a couple people that had done it before and more friends that have done it since. 
And even Eric Carter, I believe, reported having doing it, I think it was like the end of December, maybe January. The top 20 meters is super, super firm bulletproof. Meaning in the past seasons that I've done it, I've skinned all the way to the top. It does get steeper, as you can see with the, the orange and red, it does get, you know, up to 35 degrees. And so, you know, you can do a lot of switchbacks typically, but now, when I did it, I couldn't even get a toe in. That's where I actually put my crampons on and I was really kicking in. And that's where I would choose to have my ice axe. You can chop steps for your friends and then they can walk up following it. Again, I'd put my skis horizontally and I'd use them to help pull me up as well because the skis will put the brakes and all that, have a little bit more grip. Um, Mount Patterson also has a boot pack. And in the past, I've just, you know, punched in a track. And when I went and did it, it was super unconsolidated, really fast in its snow, and it, it was just falling out from underneath me. And um, it was really hard to actually put in a good track. And so um, one of the guests that was with me, we actually short roped them up and helped them just have better footing. And people did use their ice axes. Jason, when you went and did it, the next week it was more solid, you were saying, hey? Ice Complete ice. ice. You cut steps. You blade each person. Okay. And then I was speaking to Chris Lawrence, another guy that was out there the week after you or Jason, and he was saying, you know, similar conditions to what you're reporting. And he's like, I probably wouldn't even use it anymore. He hasn't scoped it. I would recommend if someone wants to check it out and report back to us, is traversing around the other side and putting in a new track. What did you do? Uh, the past was pretty icy, but it was? It was? Step, but still you have to get the step. Okay. And there's just a skin track to the turn on the like just like it's Oh, so icy, there was a skin like track to the turn on the ball? Okay. Okay, it goes again now. Okay. But the boot pack's pretty right now. So the boot pack you said was super icy? Yeah, it's pretty icy. Okay. So yeah, I mean, if someone wants to go scope out, you know, wrapping around and trying to go up the other side or have that extra equipment, I was saying that'll give you the added security. And then, you know, you're asking one of the places where you could use your rope. Well, if you have a confident partner, they can help bring up the other people. They could have a seated belay up top or they could short rope them. So. Yeah. Um, just actually on that, the, the, um, one thing I would say, and I think it, uh, talking about the gear, it is like such a bummer to get out on a trip and then get turned back for some reason because you don't have the right equipment. So I think there's often like a rationale, at least in the group, to have like the crampons or the ice axe because like there's been times when you go out and you spend all day getting there and then ah, that last little bit sets you back. And Tremor in particular, there's not really like a common workable uh, go around. Like you're, you're going through that notch if you're doing the, um, the traverse. So having the gear to, to get you through uh, makes sense. You don't really want to, yeah, have the gear. Um, oh yeah, so yeah, I just, I do this in shot, this shot. I, I talked about going up that ridge, but when you get to that column, you get past that little crux. Um, it is quite a nice ridge to go from that call up the, I think it's the north, uh, northeast ridge of Tremor. Um, and you can skin often, most of the time, depends if, if you know, on a good snowpack, you, you may have to boot, you know, boot an ice axe up to the top, but great little peak there. You know, if you want to go for something steep and you have the time, maybe you're doing a three-day three trip, you can ski that north base if the, if the shrund is looking good, which you can scope as you go up, or just going up and down the ridges. It's, it's the highest peak in the spearhead. I'm a bit of a peak backer, so like some of these comments will be about getting the peaks, um, which I, I do good. Uh, I, I'm bad with numbers. It's the tallest. <laughs> I don't know. 2691. Oh! <laughs> 2691. Uh, oh, yeah, this is you, Holly, right? Oh, no, no, this is me first. And the bird trend was pretty filled in from uh, the spearhead shoulder as of today, but Great. I didn't see all the way around. Yeah, I think a friend of mine skied it not too long ago, so I think it's, it's, uh, it's going right now. Um, okay, uh, and the next one, I guess I should use the map for a second. So. Uh, after you get a tremor, um, you go across the platform glacier, which is quite straightforward, you, kind of a flat area that cruise down and up. And then you get to a call that's between Quiver and Ripsaw Peak. And the next part of the trip is to go down the Ripsaw Glacier. And the really kind of standard uh, routing here is to maintain a, a high elevation and do a big contour across the head of the glacier and try and um, 
keep your elevation up so that you, you know, if you do it, if you really stay high, you can actually get to this um, call that leads down to the Canadian Glacier. Um, and so lots of people, by far the predominant route is just keep as much elevation, do this big contour. But it's not like a particularly pleasant, uh, you know, that side going all the way around is like super enjoyable. And um, this area uh, does have crevasses and there's actually been uh, one rescue there where a, a party, one member of a party fell into a uh, slot as they were doing that big traverse and yeah, whole rescue ensued with uh, Sark coming out. The lady was fine, but um, landed on a, a snow bridge and, and wasn't, uh, didn't, didn't have any injuries or anything. But it's, I just want to highlight that on that ripsaw glacier, oh yeah, first off, the ripsaw peak is actually like probably the easiest peak to grab on the spearhead traverse. It's just like a short little zip up. It probably should even be named because it's just kind of a, but it's a peak, it's a named peak and like you can tick that one and it's quite nice. You can skin all the way to the top and have a good view and got a picture from the top later on in this show. But um, if you come back down, instead of doing that huge traverse across, you can actually get a bit of a run down the Ripsaw Glacier. So actually like turn it into some turns and then do a very like not big elevation ascent back up to the to the call. So you avoid doing the traverse, you don't run over any crevasses or you don't, you stay away from those crevasses that are there and you, you get a bit of a run. So I don't, a thought on a, an option. Okay, so similar, but talking about the access, um, to get from Ripsaw to Naden Glacier, first just acknowledging, thanks Matt for bringing that up, it's it's super crevassed, this is that answers that question of when to rope up versus not. Um, if you can see where the holes are, that's okay, but if you can't see, I would consider roping up through that section. If you don't have a track, again, people start following tracks on the Spearhead Traverse, I'll admit, I started following a track next thing I know, I'm like, what am I doing on top of Fitzsimmons? Like, don't follow tracks blindly, like know exactly where you're going, okay? Um, that being said, you know, how are you gonna get down onto the Nadine Glacier? It's super rocky, and some years it's filled in a lot more, some years not at all. Um, this year, this top photo is, I took the other day, and I went to the far, side where mark number three is where I descended last year and it worked but this year you can see these big rocks which don't seem that big in the picture but they're actually quite large in person um, and so we were sidestepping with our skis on there is where that red circle is there is a some old tat some webbing that someone's put on the rock I wouldn't trust any old webbing. I'd definitely, you know, bring your own gear. So I actually had my own sling and I used the webbing and then I removed my sling and I descended without a rope. That being said, I don't actually think it's now the best option. I would actually prefer to go with number one. I spoke to some people that did that route this year and it was clean the whole way. You, there, there's a big rock if you wanna use a sling and lower some friends with the rope until they all feel secure. And if you're more confident, then you can lower and remove your, your rope and your sling at that point. Um, the route number four, I've done before in the past as well, but again, I don't know if it's filled in enough. This year, it's super rocky passing through this zone here. Um, I don't know what year this photo was taken, but you know, it does, there's a line that you can get through and then come down, but you have pretty big exposure there with the rock. So, you know, there's some little cruxes along the way of doing the Spirit Traverse that people don't think are a big deal, but this is one spot where people stop and they're like, holy crap, how am I getting down through this section? So just preparing and having that information ahead of time of how you're gonna get through it and knowing what point in the day it's going to be, it's just really good to know so it's not a surprise that hits you all of a sudden. Any questions on that? Oh, I see some questions. Uh, I see two. Okay, go the closest button. Which time of day would you try to aim for that one? Um, doesn't really make a difference. It, the snow is pretty horrible. If you're not skiing, <laughs> you know, you're just getting through the rock sections to get onto the main glacier. So, um, you know, if I'm doing a three-day traverse, I typically camp on the Trimmer Glacier, so I'd usually be there around 9 a.m. I try to start really early in the morning. First daylight is when I'm moving, just so I have extra time. And then if it heats up throughout the day, then I can sit out part of the day if I have to. 
Any other there, questions? Yeah. Yeah, that, that's south facing, right? Do you find that yeah. you often that you steps into it easier because of the bullet proof north facing blue pads? Like, do you take yeah. your skis off and just kind of stop down? Yeah, you could for sure. Um, I have, you know, I, with my husband one year, we came down this side here and I was epicking a little bit and I actually down climbed a section of it. So, yeah, you can, you can get your foot in. It's just not really solid snow. It's pretty loose. It's like pretty faceted, rocky. What's the scale on Oh, I can't answer that question. Um, no, this, these one, two, threes is me covering my crappy writing one, two, three, and because I was in the field drawing this picture as I was, that rock right there is as tall as me, just to give you perspective. Does that answer? Okay. The options. Okay, so um, when you come down that rock uh, feature onto the Nadine Glacier, the Nadine's quite a nice flat glacier that you can just cruise across. And uh, it's a point where there's um, there's a, an option that will consider an exit option, and then there's like some fun options. So I, I thought I'd go through both of those. So the Nadine is just on the other side of this uh, this peak here, and you're you're really at the back end, like you're pretty much halfway distance-wise around. Maybe it's it's hard to, when you talk about distances on the spearhead and elevation gain, the last 12 kilometers is the Singing Pass Trail, which kind of takes an hour of just standing and going down. So it almost doesn't really count that part. So I tend to think of the distances as like to Singing Pass. I think you're, you're about halfway uh, effort-wise and distance-wise. And um, from that point, you know, you're, you are at the back end, you're going into like high up in terrain with, with lots of glaciated, um, complex train to move through. And so if you if you're at a point where you're like, hey, we're you know, either weather's coming in or we, we, we're gonna struggle with some of that bigger, more difficult terrain, um, there is an option. Now it isn't a gimme. It's not like uh, you're just walking out through forested terrain, but um, it is a point where you can drop down into the Fitzsimmons Valley down the Trenton Glacier. Um, you do a little climb up to a call just below Macbeth and uh, it's got a good down and out. And when you drop down into the Fitzsimmons, it's not, uh, one getting down the I've got pictures of the curtain, but it's it's a it's a big piece of terrain. But also once you're down there, it's not like you're just in a creek that you follow up. You would not want to walk down the Fitzsimmons. It's kilometers of unpleasant forest. Not that I've done it, but that's what it looks like when you go across the peak to peak. Um, so the typical way is to go up um, to up Russet Creek to the uh, Keith and Claire Hut or Case and Claire Hut, and then go um, over Cowboy and then down onto the Singing Pass Trail and out. So it's it's not a um, it's not a, a you know, totally straightforward exit, but if you can get through this piece of terrain, this is a lot easier to navigate than the um, more complicated, um, larger terrain beyond it. Um, and there, there's actually another option. If you go over to the Macbeth Glacier, um, you can come down the Macbeth Glacier into a little basin. Usually the traverse goes on a ridge and over, but you can get down from there onto the Fitzsimmons. There's just, there is a steep section there. It's not, uh, it's definitely, uh, you know, a slope that's um, large enough to have lunch, but it's another option to get down. That, uh, Curtain Glacier that you would go down is actually a, a fantastic run. So I've highlighted as like one of the options. If you're, you know, they say you're doing a four day and you want to camp in that area, or if you're just going out to do the Curtain Glacier, it's a heck of a run. Um, it's it's long. Uh, it starts out with a pretty good north aspect, and then it kind of swings um, to have maybe a bit more of a westerly as you descend into the creek. But tremendous run, and actually the peak is a wicked peak. Again, like climbing the peaks, and um, you, you can like skin up until it gets steep, and maybe end up on your on your boots and boot packing up, and then you get up to a nice ridge that's got a good little kind of knife edgy ridge, not like a crazy knife, but a little bit of a a good ridge up to a summit right in the middle of the whole spear ridge. You're looking all around, so it's like definitely a good peak to snag. Um, and then that run is great, but it's like big terrain, big glacier. You certainly want to um, have a sense of where you're going, visibility. Uh, it's one of the nice things is as you're going across the traverse, like around Patterson, especially over that south ridge, you can look across and get a really good sense of the condition of the glacier. So, you know, if it looks like this, in a lower snow year, you might be, oh, okay, I'm gonna be a bit cautious. There's a lot of seracs open and, and crevassed uh, areas. Uh, and, you know, you, maybe you'd be more careful, but if it's like a big um, planar face with lots of good looking skiing, it's, it's a, a place to go for sure, a good place to check out. Um, Holly, you were just there. Um, so yeah, so like I was saying, three weeks ago, when I did the spearhead in three days on 
day two in a bit, the storm started rolling in. And I knew my day three would be pretty horrible in a full whiteout on the middle of this whole spearhead traverse. So we didn't move as far on our second day. We got out and we, I parked us on Nain Glacier. Like, you know, Matt was saying, it's a pretty mellow, awesome glacier to camp on. That being said, I had two options in the morning. I woke up super early at 4 a.m. I thought, okay, do I start, you know, slogging out the last half of the Spearhead Traverse in a full whiteout with a big storm coming in? And I was breaking trail 40 centimeters deep. I was sinking with my skis. Or do I just climb a little bit and get a really awesome run all the way down the Curtin Glacier and do a long wrap around to the Keys of Claire's Hut? So that's what we opted for. Um, as you can see, the visibility isn't great, but I can still see well enough to put in a track. Um, I don't know if anyone can see this. This is a tiny little person right here. And you can see how big their crevasses are. So in these photos of Matt's, um, that giant crevasse was right here. And it's a lot more filled in in this photo. And the photo before that, oops, sorry, wrong way. This is super filled in, which is awesome. So, you know, this, like Matt was saying, looks like an epic run. When I was coming down, I was following the shadow line. It was all snow. And every time I would traverse over here, I saw giant monsters of seracs that wanted to eat me. And so I traversed back towards the rocks. I didn't have the best visibility. I traversed back across giant serac trying to eat me. I traversed. So what I'm getting at is right now, current conditions, is this is not filled in very well. If you're there on a bluebird day though, this is a pretty epic ski run. It's, it's magic. But I would definitely avoid the open slots. And I was able to come down and come around and park under this rock. You could wrap all the way around. It looked, this would look all filled in and onwards. So um, yeah, just some current conditions for you. Any, any questions on that? Uh, last question on this one question. The one you had, so about the, the lines. Yeah, the, the, the three different lines. I kind of use the telephone that. Are these available online? Like, the one that I used um, No, that was just me sketching on the computer late last night. Yeah. Um, a lot of them are. If you go on to, you know, whether if you're looking at Fat Map and you're pulling up lots of different tracks, but same with Gaia, if you turn on your public tracks, you can see a lot of them. But like I said, I don't know who's to trust because they could have gone the left way and totally epic, and now they have a track up, and now I'm following it. When I, like, I, I can tell you that you don't want to follow my track. It would have been better to go the other way. So I would do your research and draw your own track if you can. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, the question. So if you're kind of in the middle of it and you have a storm rolling in, let's say you can't chat how much camera, you kind of play just the how much camera it by when you know it's still more than two centimeters and you use that to assess your distance. Yeah, for sure. That's actually a great decision making point. You know, like I was saying, um, I was out there and I saw a storm rolling in. Already I was breaking trail up to 40 centimeters, but I knew it was unconsolidated, the snow. There wasn't any slab properties to it, meaning like I'm sinking into it. I didn't have any cracking, moving. I didn't have any signs of instability around me. As far as other avalanches in my area, I saw none that day. Um, you know, any, everywhere from tremor onwards. That being said, you do have cell reception on all the ridge lines. So if you, you know, have a best friend that you can check in with, you know, as your emergency contact and say, hey, has there been any reports in the area? Um, but I don't like my real-time decisions being based on information like that. I want it to be based on what I see. And so I saw like big storm system rolling in. I knew that conditions were only gonna get worse. They weren't gonna improve. And so I was able to bail and come out an easier option. Yeah. So I think, you know, as we continue along, and if anyone has any questions at any point, like you should always have a plan A, B, C, D, like have different options of where you can bail. Like 
you know, as Matt was already saying, at Tremor, that's a really good spot to turn around. It's really easy to get back. But once you've kind of wrapped around, you've got the curtain, you had the Macbeth, but you don't have a lot of other options to exit beyond out of the Alpine at that point. Okay. Oh yeah, okay. Uh, speaking of options, she's had some good options in there too. Um, and the, the Nadine, so this is that uh, traverse across the Nadine, that's that little step that we were talking about, that's going up to drop down the curtain. And this glacier right here is, is a, a killer run. If you're camped out back there, I think it's like maybe 700 meters. It's a heli ski run, so you know they fly out people for like a thousand bucks a day to go ski it. And if you're hanging out there and you got a bit of time, it is definitely worth skiing. It's a, it's a great run. I, I did it on the way to the McBride one time. Did not climb back up. Obviously, if you go down, you're going to be climbing back up, but you could like take a day pack and do it. So a nice option there. Uh, Macbeth Glacier. This is another kind of like little minor um, uh, route finding item. From that native, you climb up to the call there and cruise down to get onto this ridge line that you fall over to Iago. And most people, again, do this big like contouring descent to try and maintain as much elevation so they can just slide in to, to the ridge crest there. But, uh, you know, again, those like double fall line uh, contours aren't always the most pleasant ski runs. And like, it's actually quite a nice ski run. You can just bomb down the Macbeth, get a great run in. There's a little, like it benches out, and then you do a little bit of a skin up and you're back on the ridge and you have, you like, get that first shot that, that uh, when we got to the decision points with my buddy Simo skiing with the big mountains, that was right there. It's like a killer run. So, you know, Take advantage of those runs if you're out there, and um, don't always just like I'm going to maintain all that elevation to get, you know, get the, to the call. Yes. Where the what? Yeah, it's. Uh, I think it's maybe just. Is it in here or it's it's right on this ridge line? I'm not sure the elevation. I don't know the elevation, but it's right along that ridge. I think it's right. Which a really interesting uh, point. Um, it requires a cross under the south face of Macbeth. And I have heard uh, Connie Allenson was like, ah, that like is going to put people in a need to cross through avalanche terrain. And then especially if, if you get a big dump and you're there, the exit down is avalanche terrain and the exit across is avalanche terrain. It's, it does have, um, you know, there's going to be a need for awareness and care uh, when that hut is there. That, you know, when it gets built. All right, so the Iago Ascent, um, I pulled the fat map, the Avalanche app on here so we could all see how much there is that we have to travel through. Um, so like Matt was showing you guys, you're gonna, you know, if you ski down the face and then they hit his red line, you get over here and you're climbing this ridge line. So the easiest way is to just literally stay on the ridge line. Some people, you know, some other tracks go down this way, but it's putting you into pretty big avalanche terrain. And I don't know about y'all, if you're trying to ski as much as you can, or if you're doing it more for a traverse. So um, me, I would follow this ridge line and then drop down. There are some tracks that Matt has in his book that they're able to stay higher and it really just depends on the current conditions. I myself haven't been able to maintain an edge to stay high, so I usually drop down a bit lower and then I'm switching back to get up and I'm crossing up the Young Glacier and you do start to have some slots up here. So again, I definitely want to have eyes on it. If I don't, then maybe that's the spot where I would choose to rope up to get up and beyond. But like Matt was saying, you know, if you get a chance to ski down this, this is, or have you talked about that yet? It's coming. Okay, it's coming. It's, it's, a, it's a really, really incredible run. Um, yeah, anything to add on that? Or do you want to talk about your descent? Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, on a three-day trip, uh, if you are camping, that ridge line that you get to is actually quite a nice spot. I, I, it, it's, it's, a, it's kind of well-located distance and elevation-wise as a campsite. Some people also drop down to the Diablo, uh, the Diablo Glacier on the other side, below Checkmist, but it's like, you're up high, you've got pretty spectacular views, it's quite a nice location. And one thing from that location, you're dropping down a big solar aspect, and so if you hit, if you get to that point late in the afternoon, it is one of the, and actually, oh, I'll talk about it, it's one of the you know big slopes that you're gonna cross, and certainly later in the afternoon, under solar impact, it could have some avalanche hazard, so you know staying there and, and waiting for the morning when it's uh, um, safer is, is an option, but, uh, from that location up on that ridge line uh, where you camp, if you want, you could, those are the kind of some of the standard routes to get up to it. 
there's a great run, again, I think it's maybe five or 600 meters down, maybe 500 down that uh, north facing Iago Glacier. And so doing a multi-day trip, that's one of the like really sweet, it's right there. If you, you know, put enough track in there, or you, you can get back to it and just use that and get a bit of train. So a nice run to hit um, on the traverse. Yeah, the reason why I put Crux on here, um, I know we've talked about a different avalanche dangers along the way, but the Iago descent is actually a pretty big in the sense that you've got lots of different hazards as you move through it. Um, and I'll just talk from the top down. So dropping in, you want to find that the actual slot. You know, you're, you're looking for some big rock horns and you could get pushed too far over. So you want to definitely have a visual and be able to look down and beyond, but then you're crossing a pretty unsupported slope. It's all, it's all rocky underneath you. Um, and you'd want to get over to this big rock scoop, but you don't want to head too far over because you have an east-southeast aspect. And like Matt was just saying, it's, it's a pretty huge slope. It's over 40 degrees above your head. And if the solar is warm enough, that snowpack, I definitely don't want to be there. So it's maybe what you want to be doing first thing in the morning. And like he said, camping on the ridge or you're crossing and passing it, you know, late in the afternoon, or maybe you're there on a cloudy day and you don't have that solar effect to be worried about. But if you're going to camp for the night, if you were coming later in the afternoon, I've camped way down here on the glacier, um, on Diabala Glacier, and it's, it's really beautiful. You've got views of check mist and you're starting to look across at the McBride and whatnot. So, um, yeah, anything to add on that? Any questions? Any questions? This one, you or me? Can't remember. We'll see what happens. Oh yeah, okay, it's me. Mental challenges. So if you were camping on Divalo Glacier, it's awesome because you're able to start climbing it first thing in the morning and the sun, the way it's hitting it, is really gorgeous with checking this in the background. But if you're doing a single day traverse, you've got one of the biggest climbs and it's the last big climb that you essentially have to do. Um, I believe it's 265 meters, which doesn't sound like that much, but at the best point in the day, it's the second biggest after tremor. And if you're going all the way around to the top, the far lookers left line to the summit of Benvolio, you're looking at like over 365, something like that meters. It, it's, a, it's a huge climb. So um, definitely you've got to get through it. It's called Heartbreak Hill for a reason. I didn't name it that way. So once again, this is where I have to stop with my partners and be like, okay, we're having a full snack break and we're like drinking a bunch of our water and we're checking our blisters and we're making sure we're all feeling good. So we still have a long ways to go and this is going to be a big climb to get through. Yeah. What's your go-to snack if you think about or calories on That's a great question. I, I, I don't have anything on top of my head right now, but I can tell you on a single spearhead day, I packed a whole bunch of cut sausage in my left pocket and a whole bunch of chocolate macaroons in my other pocket. So I was like protein, one stop where I'd take my skins off and next stop there would be like fat and like carbs and I just had the protein and the double combo all day. Don't know if my stomach was happy but <laughs> does anyone else have a fave like go to? You? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, so my buddy Ross, uh, he, he had, I was at senior him and, and uh, uh, he had this little container that had two components to two parts. Uh, compartments to it. You can get it at London Drug. It's like nice and small. And he, and he was putting uh, meat and cheese in one and crackers in the other. And I picked it up and I love it. Like I, I make myself a little uh, <laughs> crackers and cheese. They don't get crushed. The cheese. I, I kind of dropped the meat because I, I don't know. I, I just go in with the cheese and crackers. And then um, I don't know if you saw, but on uh, on Facebook, Eric Carter was giving away a ton of ex expired honey stingers. And I got a bag of honey stingers. And I've just been eating honey stingers like crazy on all my trips this year. They're like five years old, but they're no problem. <laughs> Cheesy crackers and honey stingers, and I'm loving it. Okay, I now remember, pie shoes is my go-to right now. Mango. Um, so Fitzsimmons Glacier. It's pretty much one of the big last crossings we're going to be doing. And if we're coming up 
to the Fitzsimmons Benvolio call, which is the red line 37 there, you have to cross under Mount Benvolio and over onto Overlord Mountain. And unfortunately, I've had some stories shared with me over the years of parties that have had wind slabs hitting them off of Overlord. Mount Benvolio has some pretty massive cornices. I'm pretty sure the top of that 38 is right on top of a bus size cornice. And if you're passing under there, as you can see, beautiful sunshine, um, later in the day, it's just it's heating up and you have huge crevasses as well. So um, just know that it is a faster route, but you do have the other option. It's a bigger climb to go all the way up to the platform of Benvolio and down the other side. But maybe you have to avoid that those hazards that day. Um, continuing on, when you get over onto the Overlord, you do have some pretty big decisions here. Um, the most technical part of the Spearhead Traverse is wrapping down the Overlord Rocks. I, the first time I did it, I was able to down climb it. It wasn't very far. It was literally like not even 10 meters and there was snow below me. And so if I fell, I just hit into some snow. But now, I don't know, um, has anyone gone recently? You can tell me how many meters it, the descent is? about 20 or so yeah okay it's pretty it's pretty big so i would definitely repel down it that being said the rock that this is a photo i stole off of the internet off of thank you facebook um there's a lot of webbing old tap that's put around this rock there's been you know discussion over the last two three years of oh the rock is really loose right now i wouldn't touch it oh the rock is frozen again okay it's good to use oh the rock is loose so i just don't know i can't tell you if the rock is good or bad um do you know no yeah so you guys can make it that far so i personally haven't gone that way in two years what i choose to do is i ski and skiing's really fun. I don't know about you. Is anyone here a skier? <laughs> okay. So um, the other question, though, is what are the avalanche conditions that day, and how big are the cornices? So here's a ski option that I was saying to you. You can go left of it if you like. It is steeper. And you go right of it, it's less steep. Um, it's a super fun run. And if you get fresh tracks down it, it's pretty awesome. As well, I'm always thinking, how big is my group? How long does it take each person to repel? Well, if I have a group of like eight of us and it's gonna take 10 minutes per person, that's 80 minutes just to get through the wrap station. But if we're all party shredding because average stability is super awesome that day and it's a great ski run, it's maybe only taking us five minutes. And then, yeah, we do have to do a bigger climb back up but, well, we all love traversing at this point. Um, the rappel, though, same thing, same questions. What are my avalanche conditions that day? You guys can see the avalanche hazard I was saying to you about Overlord. And as well, you have Refused Pinnacle, which is the next peak over, which this one here, right over your head as you're continuing along. And if you guys are all stacked, under there waiting for each of every person to make it down. It's a pretty long spot to be waiting with a big hazard over your head. And then below, um, Matt, you may have some stories. I don't know if anyone else in the crowd has some stories. I know um, another fellow and his friend and another fellow lost his ski and they went to get it and the one person fell into the crevasse only up to their knees, but there are some pretty open slots. So that's the spot where I would for sure maybe rope up, but then it's like, well, I'm roping up in avalanche hazard. So I'm like, oh, that's, that's a big decision, right? So I personally just really like doing the skiing now and just avoiding that rock until I know there's a secure anchor. And Matt and I were discussing, you know, maybe some folks, and I don't know if there's anyone in the crowd that wants to join the, the effort, going up there this summer and actually bolting some proper anchors so we can make a, a good wrap station. Anything to add on that? No. Okay, awesome. Any questions? Yeah. We're all in. <laughs> Last one. Oh, yeah, question. I have a question. Um, doing the ski down helps you go around? Or 
So that's a great question. Um, so if you do do the ski down, so if you wrap your hair, and you just have to stay above the crevasses, you can see the pretty open slots through here. But if you do the ski down, I would rope up here, and you still need to cross the crevasses to get back and up and over. But I personally, I've done it maybe three times now in the last three years, and I haven't had a problem going through there. Good question. Any others? One thing on that thing. One thing, uh, you know, it's, it's, it is quite challenging to ski roped, and uh, when you're when you're descending, if you go down the rock and then you, you cruise down here, you're, you're you're skiing terrain through what may have some. A lot of times, people hug underneath, but you expose yourself. But if you're if you're not hugging underneath, you're you're skiing independently generally because it's such a challenge to ski rope. So, uh, you know, that's a bit of a hazard. Whereas if you come down here and you decide, like, there's a sh fairly short climb and short section of crevasse terrain. And you're ascending, and it's much easier to travel roped ascending. So if you're like, hey, I think it's kind of sketchy, I'm going to throw on a rope. It's a heck of a lot of easier to, to ski the line and throw the rope on to get up um, rather than I don't know who skied roped. It's like a disaster. <laughs> it's like, yeah, it's like always not fun. Um, okay, just like with the spearhead traverse, we're rolling, and we're just near the end. We're almost done. Thank you for hanging on. Yes. I haven't, and I, I, I you have, yeah, okay, yeah. This year, it was, it was okay. Yeah, yeah, you know what, I actually, you've done it, so. Yeah, you know. what's your question? So, we do recommend going that, that way, we did, we were depressed last time, so we didn't do that. Okay, when you, when you did the ridge line, were you in the summer or winter? Winter. Okay, yeah, because the Overlord Glacier and the Refuse Pinnacle all along there are massive, massive cornices, and I, I wouldn't walk anywhere close to a cornice of that size. No, we did the same yeah. route, like on the rocks. You're on the rocks yeah. the whole way. Yeah, I mean, I think it would take you extra time for sure. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, um, but if you go and climb, like next time, just to go to ski the Refuse Pinnacle, you yeah, can go up and then you could wrap in to ski it. Yeah. yeah, it's possible. You're, you're looking at a more technical route, though. Yeah. And longer. Yeah. I, I'm actually super curious. I, I haven't done that. I've, I've gone in the summer up there and cruised along, and, and uh, I've seen that people have been doing it recently, and I've heard that previously people have done it. Traditionally, the Overlord Rock stuff has been such a, like, I, I don't know if people just skiing down it previously when there's a lot of snow. So it, it hasn't been a, like a normal route till now, but I'm actually personally having my call. Next time I go, I want to go check that out and see what it's like. And it's interesting to hear that you did it. And, and, and obviously the, the balance is going to be, you know, what's it like with the cornice terrain and, and how, how much time does it take? But yeah, I'm very curious about it, but I haven't done it in the winter. I saw another question. Yeah. Uh, is there a topic you're going to be on the Yeah. Yeah. Uh, how do I restart this? You can see how messy my desktop is. Ah! How embarrassing. <laughs> oh my god. Totally ashamed. Alright, fast forward it. Okay, no, 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 no. Oh, no, 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 you can come all the way down, and you see the marinal features and where Fissile is, and then you can climb back up to Keys and Claire's Hut. This is also another option for an early exit. Um, if you decided, you know, you don't want to climb Rowan, or maybe you just want to get more skiing in as well, you definitely can, and it's super awesome ski. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Um, no, no, like you don't have to do the wrap. I was just showing you where it was. So right here you could do the ski line and then you duck under this big rock and then come down here. Yeah. It's, it's a great scheme. If you want to go do it, it's awesome. And you could do it from the Keys and Claire's hut. 
So you don't have to feel like you have to do the whole spearhead traverse just to do that. You could literally just, yeah, do it from the Keys and Claire's hut in a day. I've done it from Whistler. It's, it's a good enough run that I've, yeah. like, as a day trip from Whistler, gone out to Overlord, done that run, and climbed back up. But it, it's fairly, that, that's a big crevasse down there, and it seems to be, I, I, like, looking across at it, it does look like there's some activity with crevasses opening up down there. Like, yeah. I, 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 I haven't been down there recently, and I would have some caution about that tongue, because you can see right there, there's, there's actually, like, quite a bit of features at the bottom of the tongue, and so... I yeah, so that, that tongue I go out there hiking every summer, and it's crazy. It used to be like 100 meters lower, and now it's retreated up, and there's three giant pools. So if you want to go swimming in the summertime, and for a glacier dip, that's pretty beautiful. But um, it is, like Matt said, retreating quite a bit. So definitely ski with caution. You maybe are skiing roped up, depending on how filled in it is when you're there. Yeah, 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 yeah. Great questions. Home stretch. Sorry. Oh, it's all you saw it all. Okay. Uh, okay. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, yeah, rolling. So uh, okay, uh, as as you may have gathered, I like to climb some mountains. And so if you're if you're coming out uh, and you you've either come down the overlord and climb back up or come down the rock step, you know, typical route is to get over to the Fizal rolling call. There's this like giant wind scoop. And typically you go up and over it, although you can't actually sneak through it generally, but you know, it's often you go up and over it, and you're just so close to the summit of Roland, it just makes sense, right? <laughs> Why not? Uh, and on the flip side, if you've done that, like again, the typical route is to zip down over to Casey and Claire, but if you go up, well, you know, often that's a bit of a wind hammered slope, but if you got good conditions, or in the spring could be corny. Um, you might get a nice corn run, and that, that is a great place to be skiing while the sun's lower in the sky. I, I would be irresponsible to say it's a great place to ski during the sunset, because that means you're going to be going out in the dark, but it is a good place to ski in the sunset. But anyway, um, it's uh, a super nice place to be, and a, a, a little bit extra run, so I would say uh, a worthwhile extra. And then our last thing uh, was people, you know, we had lots of tips about route finding and gear and all that stuff, but I would say the number one tip to having a good time is to go with good people. Right? Yeah, good people can make a crummy day fun. Uh, crummy people, yeah, it's kind of hard to have a good day, personally. So pick your people. And I think one thing to do is to really make sure you pick people that you have shared objectives, risk tolerance, um, abilities. Uh, yeah, yeah, objectives. Um, it's uh, when, when you have a mismatch in some of those categories, it's really easy for things to go sideways. And I think that's where lots of the trips that go wrong go wrong, and um, you know, if, if you do end up, or the alter, other alternative is if you go with somebody who does have a different set of objectives or risk tolerances, to be willing to modify to lowest common denominator and give people the veto um, to keep the group safe. There's no value in going out and getting in trouble or getting hurt, so pick a good group. And then the last piece I wanted to say, oh, this is by the way, on the summit of Ripsaw. So grab that peek, because look at how pretty it is. Um, but anyway, uh, and the last thing I wanted to say is, um, I'm going to make a plug for being friendly when you're out in the backcountry. I think it's really worthwhile going and saying hi to groups as you go by. Have a little quick chat. Yeah, I know. Be friendly. Be chatty. You never know when like, like you might develop a friendship. I've like made lifelong friends wandering around out there. Not a ton, but a couple. And, um, and, and I think we should be a friendly... Well, you know, uh, uh, it's not uncommon to like bump into somebody and go, hey, where are you going? And they're like, I'm not telling this guy. You know, they're kind of like... Office, but I feel like we've got shared values. I met you on Circle Lake. There you go. See? So be friendly. Say hi to people as you're out there. So that's my plug. Let's be a friendly community. Anyway, that's it. Thank you very much.